Okay, right. Hello, everybody. Um, I have changed the location slightly for this um, reading. But uh, we are here, and um, this is going to be another reading of my book, Walking on Cinders. And uh, we're doing this every day, so we are now at chapter 9 um, of the book. And just to update you, um, I thought that it had been several days since we had any baked goods. Um, so we now have baked goods again. Um, this one, courtesy of myself, it's a Victoria sponge that I made. Um, so that's very good with a cup of tea. That'll go down well in a moment's time when I've uh, read to you. Um, but this is chapter nine. I also note that I'm also now in competition with Dolly Parton, who is reading a bedtime story every night. Probably a different age group. Uh, but um, yeah, go and listen to that because it's really, really good if you're, uh, if you're interested. But this is chapter nine of Walking on Cinders. The evening was just beginning to draw in around the hillside when something moved within the hedgerow. Sensing that there was no longer fear in the air, the creature, a beautifully preened male peacock, strutted out into the open and padded across the soft ground. In the air was a smell of death and destruction. This the peacock understood. It also knew that this was human destruction. To the far left of where the creature now stood, high on its scrawny legs, lay the great mound of metal carnage, a plane without wings and a tailpiece which had been thrown the length of the field upon impact. The sight, although horribly dangerous, now felt peaceful. As the sun took one last look out across its kingdom before disappearing behind the hilltops, the peacock began to call, all at once and very loudly. Perhaps it had been startled by the moon's sudden appearance, or by something else. Whatever it was, the poor creature was left totally disorientated. For a moment, it hesitated, waiting for its senses to return, and then silently and suddenly, the peacock, with its head hung low, left this strange and newfound kingdom to return to the safety of the hedgerow. Black. Pitch black. Not a sound to be heard and nothing to see. But if you concentrate, home in your senses, you might just hold on to what little grip you have on life. In the black you can see nothing, and so you concentrate on what you can taste and hear. Fear in the air, a strange taste on the lips. You've tasted it before, but you can't pinpoint where. Your brain is not working correctly and you've lost all sense of memory. Nothing exists beyond the here and now. Concentrating even harder, you try to hear. To the right of you is the regular breathing of another person. Their breath is strained, but they're breathing at least. And this discovery spurs you on and slowly you begin to remember. Friends, arguing, smiling and laughing. And you have no recollection of why such things happened, but the memories are there. A picture of a landscape viewed from high above flickers before your eyes. For a moment you wonder if it's all a dream or some horrible nightmare. Only now do you discover your sense of perception has also been damaged. And you suddenly find yourself laughing inside your own head. A voice and a face fills your mind, but the image is faded and the voice is far away. Slowly, the breathing you can hear labours and the laughter takes control. You cannot fight against it because, after all that has happened, you feel safe lying here in limbo. And you realise that you don't want to fight. You don't want to survive. The laughing empowers you, quickly taking over your mind. And then it stops, as suddenly as it began. Your last thought is of peace and well-being. You're safe now. No more laughter and no more tears. Just the blackness and the beauty that lies beyond. Now that's chapter 9, and uh, what I didn't mention at the start of the book was that that obviously is quite a, a short chapter, so what I will do is continue to read, and I'll read chapter 10 for you as well, because it's a Friday, and we have uh, cake, and uh, we have tea, so uh, let's continue, and, and I'll read another chapter for you. Chapter 10. For Chris, there was only ever one outcome, one conclusion, and that was to survive. If he were to die, he would die in battle. He would not die here, a passenger on a solitary jet plane, where no one cared if he existed. There came a point, he couldn't tell when, that he found he could open his eyes and slowly adjust to what was around him. Firstly, he noted the darkness, not only within the compartment, but also outside. 
there was a crack in the roof, and through it a million tiny stars danced. It was ironic, for heaven could have been where he ended up. Secondly, he noticed the injury. For a moment, he had feared the crash had caused him such injury that he could no longer feel the pain. The only real evidence appeared on his right arm, which was bleeding in several places, but his life had been spared. It was clear to Chris that the force of the impact had thrown the jet some considerable distance. Perhaps the tail of the cockpit had broken away from the main body. It was only when he pushed weakly upwards that he discovered the true extent of the damage and felt the thumping pain in his head. The roof of the compartment fell away from the rest and he used his better hand to create a hole big enough to crawl through. Then, although the pain was close to unbearable, he pulled himself up to the top. Exhausted, he fell back against the crumpled metal. There was nothing he could do now, yet he had to go on. Creating the opening had begun a chain of events. As he pulled himself up through the space, Chris realised it had been raining in the time between the crash and now, not only because it fell in large streams from the cracks, but because he could taste it in the air. The cold water was fresh and clean, yet he could smell death. There was a sudden sensual overload which caused him to look back down the compartment where he noticed a pair of eyes in the gloom. They were full and round in the darkness, and that meant he was no longer alone. An urge to shout out was all that Chris could feel building up within him, as the flash of something in his head reminded him that there were others lying back inside the metal casing. Hello, he called hoarsely down into the darkness. Panic was setting in. Are you all right? It sounded so pathetic. His mind was dazed such that he couldn't remember the name. Time passed as Chris waited, unable to draw his gaze away. Then from within, a slender pale hand surfaced above the metal edge, and the soldier, squ soldier squinted to see if the body was clear. Believing that, the, believing that what little debris they had avoided crushing with the helpless figure, he took his left arm in her right and supported the weight, pulling Jennifer up through the crevice and into the light of the stars and the moon. At once he realised how vulnerable and cold she looked in the pale moonlight, her skin white, highlighting the dark red of her smeared lipstick. There was a cut on her right thigh and something had pierced through the material of her dress. It was still bleeding slightly. Her face was terrified and that seemed to scare Chris the most. He was one of the most famous women. Here was one of the most famous women in the world, reduced to a helpless childlike state. Oh Chris. The sound was so faint as it passed barely through her parted lips. But Chris heard the plea and responded by wrapping her in his arms to keep the night's chill at bay. I don't don't know what, what we can do, he stuttered, as tears formed in his eyes and fell upon the beautiful woman's dress. I, I just hope that nothing awful has happened. Several hours passed and slowly Jennifer began to regain some strength. Together, although they were both severely weakened, she and Chris sifted through the wreckage for their friends' bodies and belongings. They were witnesses to so many dreadful things that night, and they began to realise how truly grateful they were to be alive. With some sharper pieces of the wreckage, Chris had managed to open the crevice further, and allowed the moon's haze to fall upon the two crumpled figures that remained. Thomas and Ewan were injured far worse than either Chris or Jennifer, Thomas particularly having been knocked out by the look... Thomas particularly having been knocked out by the look of a gash to his forehead. Chris had made sure that both men were laid safely and as comfortably as possible under the cover of some nearby trees, before heading to the search the remains of the cockpit. Jennifer returned. Jennifer remained, her bright eyes blue and filled with tears as she sought comfort close to the dark form of her dearest companion. As with any tragedy, survival is the utmost concern, but it can be stripped from you at any moment. Chris realised this first hand when he paced towards the tangled remains of the cockpit and stared down at the lifeless shapes that lay there. Entangled amongst the controls over which they had once had so much power, the pilot and the navigator had given their lives for the job they loved. This was, as Chris had always said, no longer a game. Two brave men had lost their lives in a bid to save four other souls, and Thomas could have been standing alongside them in the cockpit. His too might have become another life lost to the cause. Chris had never thought deeply about the consequences of war before. He was a brave man and he didn't like to think about the harsh reality. Now though, he had no choice. 
the proof of the lengths to which men will go to honour their country lay before him. As he moved away from the wreckage and noticed a slight breeze in the air, Chris made the decision there and then to plan, continue and to never give in. For if there were people left on the planet who could end the great war through struggle, he would make sure that he and his comrades would be the ones. For several hours after they had escaped from death, Chris and Jennifer talked through what would happen next. They spent a great deal of the night in quiet conversation, and by the time the moon reached its highest point, they had finally happened upon an idea. Chris had worked out early that it would not take Colonel Smith long to realise the jet was missing, and when he did, he would alert the French United Forces who would begin to search for the wreckage. That being the case, if the crash site was discovered, it would not be inhumane to leave the poor dead souls in their final resting places. Chris did not like the idea of being discovered. This mission was by no means a secret, but he knew that fewer people who had knew this mission was by no means a secret, but he knew that the fewer people who knew about it, the easier it would be. Even if the French troops were fighting on the same side, he was here to do a job and he would complete it. He was also aware, however, however much he hated to admit it, that something about the crash was all wrong. In the years since the war had begun, military leaders had ensured a complete overhaul of the new United Army. That had led to the United Isles of Great Britain becoming the leading power in modern warfare design. Well, knowing this, Chris was adamant that they would certainly never have let anything happen to their leading soldiers. Not by accident. But what about by force? The inner workings of any military organisation had similarities, but the Thames Regimental Barracks was perhaps a little different from the rest. Remembering now, Chris realised how Colonel Smith had been quick to accept the President's proposal to post fine young soldiers overseas. In fact, he had waved them onto the jet and away, with little planning or preparation. Perhaps he had, behind closed doors, spoken to his French counterparts, but it had been left to Chris, Thomas and Ewan alone to make sure they were well equipped. Most importantly, Chris had said, they should each carry a newly developed GPS holographic map. This was a thin computer screen, about the thickness of a piece of cardboard, that had long since done away with the conventional OS map. Jennifer was tending to Ewan as he started to get accustomed to his surroundings, while Chris kept one eye on Thomas. I've been thinking about things, he motioned in Jennifer's direction, breaking the silence. About how any of this could happen. It can't have been an accident, we all know that. What are you suggesting then? Jennifer asked, intrigued. Well, it's the whole establishment, isn't it? Nothing's as it used to be, and the world is corrupt. It's all about money nowadays. I mean, it was before, but a, a human sacrifice still meant something back then. I'm just not sure what Colonel Smith meant for us. Chris finished, his face grave and disappointed. Jennifer couldn't respond for a moment. Are you suggesting that he wanted us killed? She gasped. I believe it would have been viable for us to get out of the way. Yes, especially me. I could be a great danger to him, to his plans. But just hold on a minute, Jennifer murmured, trying to work the whole thing out in her head. Are you sure about this? It just might have been an accident, after all. I mean, I know it's unlikely, given the situation, but we've got to consider the possibility. Deep down, she knew she held a loathing for Colonel Smith just as much as Chris, but she didn't want to jump to conclusions just yet. Well, I suggest we do our best to make sure, Chris finished, looking up towards the sky with the briefest of seconds. I have our GPS holographic maps. I recovered them from the wreckage along with our belongings, but amongst the papers and our rations and clothes, I found something else, Jennifer. Chris was speaking seriously, as if the boss's sweetheart had something to hide. What are you talking about, Chris? Jennifer questioned, slowly considering anything that might incriminate her. No, she couldn't think of anything. Chris remained, staring forwards, just above Hen Jennifer's head. I think you know exactly what I found, if you stop to think about it. I'm afraid not, Chris. I... I would be interested to know, though, how you think I've compromised your mission. The atmosphere between the two had changed immediately. There was a tension now, an apprehension, where before there had been a mutual understanding. Well, right now, Chris said, I think it's better if I don't reveal too much. In the morning, hopefully, you and Thomas will be well enough for us to move out from here. Then we'll look at our GPS together, and only then will I reveal what I've found. 
I feel it would be best to keep everyone in the picture so that we all know where we stand. Jennifer remained silent. She was overwhelmed by Chris's sudden change of direction. In her eyes, he was taking things way out of proportion. At times, he was a very hard man to understand, and now Jennifer realised it was best not to try. For Chris, who had led a band of men to war and would still have them in the best state of mind while they were fighting, it was simple. In and amongst the wreckage, he had pulled their belongings away from the crash site and had found a very interesting object hidden inside Jennifer's sheet music and set lists. What compelled him to look there, he did not know, but he was happy that he had done so. The comrades spent a very cold night in the fields of central France. The weather conditions were far harsher than they had been used to at home, with a strong wind chill that uh, shook them to their core. Chris had decided early on that it would be best to take turns in keeping watch. He would take the first shift, while Jennifer rested, and then they would take turns until sunrise. The night's bad weather gave way to a glorious sunrise for the dawn, and it looked as if it would remain a clear day. Chris had been right in his predictions. In truth, there was a vast improvement in their situation by late morning. Ewan and Thomas felt physically stronger, even though their injuries were not completely healed. And as he learned, leaned against the old tree that was their refuge and watched, droopy-eyed as the sun shone above the distant hills, the soldier was thankful for this, as today they had a lot of work to do. Before long, Jennifer began making breakfast. She considered them very lucky, for they had escaped not only with their lives, but between them they had recovered some of the supplies and possessions that had been on board when they came down. It meant that Jennifer had a change of clothes, while the others had recovered ration packs that would provide nourishment for the many days to come. But the Forster sweetheart had also spent a lot of the night unable to sleep, worrying instead about what Chris might reveal in the morning. But when a bleary-eyed Thomas moved his head upwards and acknowledged them for the first time, it was all soon forgotten. He was no longer as ill as they had first thought, and that was a great relief. Nice sky, he muttered, his words a little slurred. Where are we? A plane came down, Chris spoke calmly, drawing his friend's hand across the various cuts and scratches. We were lucky to get out of it alive. For Thomas, those words were like an invisible key. We, we, we didn't lose anyone, did we? He fumbled, somehow a little stronger. I'm afraid the pilot and the navigator didn't make it, Thomas, but the rest of us are okay. Ewan is a little dazed still, but so far, Jennifer and I have been able to get most things sorted. And speaking of which, came another voice from behind as Ewan walked towards the pair. You didn't explain why nobody has come to find us yet. Chris was silent for a moment. I doubt they'll come, Ewan. Or if they do, it won't be until they realise we haven't arrived. I don't know for certain, but we needn't waste any time hanging around here. His friends contemplated this for a moment. I guess that's why you've left the bodies then, he replied. We can at least hope they might be picked up as a lone jet with no passengers. Yes, Chris finished. Or at the very least, let's hope they leave it be. Those who come to find us could be friend or foe. We've no idea where the enemy are placed. In any case, we don't know where we're going from here, so it could be harder for them to find us. Here, the staff sergeant paused to consider how best to phrase his next sentence. We can soon make use of our GPS holographic maps, which are only a little damaged. However, I'm afraid there is something I need to discuss with you all first. That doesn't sound good, Ewan said weakly. No, Chris replied, but it would be much worse on an empty stomach. And so the four friends plodded over to the campfire and warmed their hands on the flames. The sparks that danced upwards towards the sky drew Thomas towards the warmth, then he stared intently, as if there was some lost secret held within the flickers of light. Jennifer had rigged up a makeshift stand from some metal piping Chris had recovered from the wreckage, and upon it stood a large metal mess tin filled with boiling water and a slowly expanding ration pack. The porridge that was eventually shared between them wasn't bad, considering the situation. Chris by now had grown used to what he called an acquired taste. It was all the, always either a little dry or far too soggy, but it was food just the same, and this gave them the energy that they sorely needed. It didn't take long for their thoughts to wander back to the matter at hand. Before they were ready to leave the wreckage behind, and before they even questioned the GPS holographic mapping devices, they had to find out what Chris had really discovered. Their leader drew them together in an open corner of the field. He appeared to be carrying some form of document. It turned out to be a folder, 
and when Jennifer saw it, she recognised it immediately. Chris, what are you doing? he said worriedly, looking from the soldier's face to the document and back again. Don't pretend you don't know what's inside, the staff sergeant replied, as Ewan and Thomas looked on in confusion. He's going to sing us a song, Thomas smiled sarcastically, trying to bring a little light-heartedness to the situation. Chris scowled at him open with the folder. Chris scowled at him and opened the folder. Quickly, he sifted through the papers until he found what he wanted. It was a small black book. Jennifer looked immediately confused. I found this, Chris began, clearing his throat so as to be heard clearly, when I was clearing out our belongings from the wreckage. Many of Jennifer's things had spilled all over the cabin and among her papers, notes and sheet music, I found this book. Ewan moved forwards interested now in what Chris was going to reveal about the girl he'd fallen for. There was a moment's pause before his friend opened the book at the middle. It is full of secret codes and intelligence about the enemy. The book is false, and in the middle is a secret screen. Jennifer was suddenly as white as a sheet. Ewan rushed forwards to embrace her, and then took a few steps back as he caught his comrade's expressions. They were shocked, even appalled, particularly Thomas, who could not understand at first what Chris was trying to say. But, but, Jennifer began, she herself was even unable to believe it. I, I told them no. I, I, said, I said I wanted nothing to do with it. Her voice was weak. It sounded so far away. Well, he certainly looks that way to me, Chris replied simply. His words cut like knives. Jennifer, Ewan said quietly, unable to look the girl's fa- unable to look the girl in the face. Jennifer. It was more than he could take, and walking away from the group, he struggled to take the thought of his love being deceptive. The shock was visible on everyone's faces. From this, they gave a whole new meaning to their mission, and indeed their lives. I don't know what else to say, Chris said hoarsely, as the book was passed from person to person. There was no denying it. Inside was a small computer screen, which housed a world of secret, in- which housed a world of secret intelligence. When I found it, it led me to question our whole purpose. Were we even meant to survive? I don't think so, Jennifer whispered. I bet he had it all planned out. He wanted us out of the picture. But then how do you know that, Thomas said, disgusted. How do you know that we were not, that you were not, how do we know that you were not in on the whole thing and that somehow you were meant to get out alive? The force's sweetheart swallowed. Her face was still pale. Chris? Thomas, I had nothing to do with this. Months ago, a government official approached my manager to ask if I would be willing to carry documents on a secret mission. It was a stupid idea. My manager wanted me to do it, but I refused straight away. I simply can't do the whole dangerous thing. It's not me. Somehow, telling the truth in this way was the hardest thing she had ever done. Yeah, nice cover-up, Thomas continued. He believed not a word that she said. Chris remained silent perhaps thinking through the whole situation. They pursued me for weeks, Jennifer said finally. Her head was bowed in embarrassment. I kept telling them no, but they just wouldn't stop. They were asking me even on the night before we left, but there was no way I could have accepted. If I was in on the idea, then why would they have placed me on the plane? She's right, guys. This time the voice was different, as Corporal Ewan Roberts returned to the group with a profound vision. She was telling me all of this, when I was in her dressing room. Chris was now ready to respond. Even if Ewan says it's true, then we can't doubt his word, whatever our personal convictions. Jennifer breathed deeply, as if a great weight had been lifted off her shoulders, and she embraced the corporal who had protected her through chance and mutual understanding. What it means, though, Chris continued, is that someone wanted to kill us, or more to the point, wanted to destroy the secret documents at any cost. I believe the only person who would know enough to do such a thing is Colonel Smith. But why would he kill us if he's on our side? I mean, his intelligence is united. Ewan found it hard to believe their colonel could do such a thing. I must admit, Chris mused, this confuses me. But whatever the intention the colonel had, there is no denying that he was was the one to place us on the jet. He pushed through the deployment and then he okayed Jennifer's position alongside us, perhaps to incriminate her. Ewan had to admit his friend's notion was well thought out. We've got to get we've got to get out of here, Thomas stuttered, the only valuable thing his brain could manage to deliver. Yes, 
and we must keep the intelligence away from the enemy at all costs, Jennifer added. You're both right. Chris took the lead again. This was all he knew how to do. If this is what he planned to happen, then it's likely no one will have informed the French authorities about the crash. But I bet there were plenty of onlookers. Chris was panicking now. He didn't want to be seen. He didn't want to be hauled into the British embassy and made to explain something that he did not understand. They needed to make a run for it. They needed to leave now and never look back. It's probably best if we remain oblivious to the fact that Jennifer is carrying the device. Leave things exactly as they were supposed to be and act surprised when the item is eventually found. That way we will, individually, remain as safe as possible. Ewan didn't like the fact that Jennifer might be in danger if they were captured, but there was little he could do about it now. Picking up a GPS holographic map from the ground at his feet, he studied the position in which the jet had fallen. The screen was cracked in several places and many of the controls were inoperable, but it gave them an idea at least of their location. Of course, the biggest problem was that it was standard protocol to remove the location of any barracks or buildings or locations relating to the armed forces. Both the United and Reformed armies were wary of the fact that such devices might strain to the wrong hands. From here, the group of four needed to find the nearest barracks, and with none positioned on the map, although they knew one must be close, it would be that much harder. They may have crashed completely off target, but it was all they could do, and the map clearly showed a little village further to the east, and a road stretching to the south. Now all they knew was that the jet was heading south when it started to lose altitude, so their direction might just get them closer to the French barracks. What will we do? Chris spoke loudly and clearly. We'll split into pairs and take two different compass directions. Thomas and I will head south along the road until we find civilians to ask for directions to the nearest army barracks, while Ewan and Jennifer can head east and try to locate the village pinpointed on this map. They each nodded their heads in turn and shook hands as a form of agreement. But how will we keep in contact? Thomas questioned his normal speech now returning as he calmed down. This time Ewan fielded the question and Chris smiled. Well, with me and Jennifer, when we reach the village, we'll wait for you to contact us. The barracks will surely have some outposts in the nearby villages and you will need to use those to give us directions. By splitting up like this, we double the chance that we will find eventually some civilization. Unfortunately, Thomas said again, it was sarcastic this time, those GPS holographic maps will be no help at all. This one's frozen and the other three were destroyed in the crash. Well, we'll just have to make do on our own then, won't we? Chris replied. Don't leave the village, Ewan, or if you do, always return. He said it simply. The other soldier nodded again and pulled Jennifer close. There was no doubt in his mind that splitting into pairs was their only option, but he didn't stem the worry about what was to come. Before they left, they needed to share out the provisions and create a plan. They watched in amazement as Chris produced a variety of personal items, he had found them in his in the wreckage, his pen knife, and it had since done him good to service chopping off bark and freeing their torn backpacks. Jennifer was stunned to be handed her own signed photographs in their original plastic casing, while Ewan and Thomas were delighted when their own personal items were produced before their eyes. These reminders of home would make the coming journey much more bearable. Soon, possessions, rations and equipment had been divided between them. By midday, when the sun was at its highest, they were ready. Their uniforms had survived the impact surprisingly well, while Jennifer was now wearing jeans under a skirt which had been cut to, which had been cut to stop it trailing along the ground. Over her shoulders, she had created a shawl from one of the unused backpacks. It was rough on her skin, but it kept her warm. All in all, they looked a strange group, standing in the far corner of a French field, close to the wreckage of their transport. But their minds were sharp and their hearts strong. Soon, Chris and Thomas were pacing away towards a gap in the hedge at the field boundary. Quick goodbyes were always the best. It left no time for sadness or remorse. Chris had become adept in the art of quick goodbyes. Jennifer and Ewan, however, were not the same. They stood beside the oak tree and watched the others go. They stayed there together, rooted to the spot, until Chris and Thomas had disappeared from sight. Then, taking each other's hands and turning away from the wreckage, they began that long journey towards the hope that lay beyond the furthest hills. So that's chapter 10 of Walking on Cinders, chapters 9 and 10 this evening. And uh, thank you for that. I'm now going to uh, enjoy my cup of tea and uh, a piece of cake. I'll be here again tomorrow for chapter 11.